Hello, hi there. Good evening. Hi, Derek. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Tazad. Good evening, Dr. John. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi there. Good evening. Thanks for being with us today. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the first, uh, the first webinar for this year. And we are honored that we are going to have our friends from Cleveland uh, Clinic Abu Dhabi with a distinguished speaker that we are going to host today. So before doing what the welcoming, just I would like to address a few things. Uh, I'm happy and honored to welcome all distinguished guests and delegates to the first chapter of Minasu Education Academy, Civil Vascular Grand Round for 2020. Uh, we had a wonderful year last year uh, with more than uh, uh, monthly webinars and uh, Minaso Congress, which has been done in uh, uh, Bahrain this year. The webinar series in 2020 have been fruitful and rich with uh, presence of 17 scientific committee members and 16 MENA regional speaker and 10 international speakers with, with, more, uh, with more than 13,000 participant for more than 78 countries worldwide. These are a landmark for a stroke in the Middle East and we are so uh, honored that we are able to do this to increase the education about stroke in the MENA region, to involve more people with advanced treatment that they are delivering at the level of the region. MENASO and the grand round that we are conducting in a monthly base has been achieved a good uh, feedback from uh, our colleagues in the region. Many neurologists, stroke specialists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, uh, internal medicine and family uh, medicine with a neurosurgeon who's giving us a good feedback about these type of webinar. And we are looking to continue this for 2020. I will not forget that these uh, uh, activity is endorsed by the World Stroke Organization, WSO, and American Heart, American Stroke Association. Uh, no further delay, there will be a question and answer at the end of the, uh, this session, as usual, and uh, you, uh, the audience can use the Q&A box for these questions. And by the end of the session, we will have more than 15 minutes to 20 minutes to answer all your questions. I would like to uh, uh, welcome my uh, friend and uh, co-chair, uh, Professor Derek Greger. Professor uh, Greger, uh, Greger, uh, Greger is a neurology professor and neuroscience, and he is currently at uh, uh, Parkview Med Clinic. Uh, he worked in different places, including uh, Heidelberg, Germany. Texas Medical Center in Houston, and he's the founder of uh, Cerebral Vascular Disease Unit and Stroke at Copenhagen University. Uh, Dr. Derek uh, has been in UAE for the last six years, and we work together at the level of Dubai and North Emirates to build the stroke service. And uh, I can say pages about Derek, but uh, I would like to welcome him and uh, to start uh, introducing the speaker. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Suhail. Yeah, it has been a pleasure the last six years with, uh, with you and all the others. And uh, I think this uh, initiative that you um, stamped out uh, the, the Menasco Grand Rounds is amazing. And I'm just checking here, we have 763 participants. Uh, no, no words spoken yet uh, in terms of uh, our stellar speakers from the Cleveland Clinic. The Cleveland Clinic is, uh, is for, for all people who are not from the region here, is, is an amazing place. Uh, whoever is going to visit uh, Abu Dhabi should uh, should take a take a visit of the Cleveland Clinic. It is a, something between a hospital and a temple, uh, or a, a mosque. It is a, a, an incredible building, and it's very very well done. And of course, the people that work there in the Stroke Center are stellar. And we have uh, today two of them, and uh, and they also. Um, you know, they just don't talk about thrombectomies and this kind of stuff. Everybody does this. They actually chose some very very interesting and complex topics, both of them. And I have the pleasure 
of um, introducing the first speaker, Dr. Syed Irtesa Hussein, uh, who is the department chair of neurology in the Neurological Institute at the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi and a consultant neurologist with 20 years of experience. Uh, he completed his medical degree from Aga Khan University. Then he underwent extensive postgraduate training in the United States. He is American board certified in neurology, vascular neurology, neurocritical care, and neuroendovascular surgery. Dr. Hussein joined Michigan State University as an assistant professor in 2009, where he helped to establish a 24 7 neurointerventional surgery service and fellowship training program. Uh, subsequently, in 2011, he was appointed the medical director of the stroke program at Michigan State University and is affiliated um, in its affiliate Spiro Healthcare System and was promoted to associate professor in 2014. Dr. Hussein was awarded the Physician Leader of the Year uh, Award in 2015 by the Spiro Healthcare System in Michigan and uh, also his teaching awards uh, recipient from the Univers University of Wisconsin Medical School. Dr. Hussein completed uh, a couple thousand cerebral angiograms and neuroendovascular procedure uh, during his career. And he's going to talk to us today about ischemic stroke of unusual etiology. Dr. Syed Iteza, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Krieger, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, uh, and also I would like to thank uh, Dr. Suhail al Rukan. Uh, as our Minaso president and leader in the region uh, from promoting these educational activities, especially in such hard times. Um, it's, uh, we've been here at the Cleveland Clinic for the last five to six years, and uh, we've really enjoyed our relationship uh, with our colleagues in Dubai and the rest of the UAE and the region. And I think this is a great platform for us to all interact and learn from each other. So without further ado, um, I will, I will uh, start off with the first topic. So um, the format for this educational rounds was obviously case presentations. And um, so um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so um, this is a, uh, the case. Um, so 54 year old, previously healthy lady, um, no significant past history except for uh, recurrent UTIs was found to have uh, ureteropelvic junction kind of stenosis, uh, placed uh, initial stent in August 2019 and then into 2020. Um, so overall things had been fine. She had a, a stent replacement in September of 2020. And around about that time, family began to notice that she was having progressive cognitive decline. Initially just minor lapses in memory. Uh, and then they began to notice, okay, suddenly she was having problems with gait. Um, this, she kind of uh, stumbled along for some time until um, around December 2020, when after a repeat stent replacement, um, she developed significant worsening of cognition, and this time with impaired level of consciousness and ability to walk by the end of December. So over a month, progressive decline. Uh, a week prior to presentation, there had been drastic worsening, uh, where she was not talking or eating adequately. Um, past medical history, as I said, was really significant. However, there had been a 20 kilogram weight loss in the, in, over the last year for unexplained reasons. On examination, initially the patient was somnolent, uh, opened eyes only to voice, grimacing to pain and moaning. Uh, she had no coherent speech. There was spontaneous movement of the right upper and lower extremity. Uh, and there was some left-sided weakness, um, but was able to withdraw to pain. It was diffuse hyperreflexia with bilateral clonus, sustained on the right, non-sustained on the left, and plantar responses were upgoing bilaterally. She was unable to participate in sensory testing and could not stand or ambulate without assistance. So we're going to go over the external hospital investigations first. So this was in a different country, um, MRI brain at the time showed T2 flare hyperintensities identified in the gray and gray white matter junctions of bilateral cerebral and cerebellar hemispheres. Uh, these areas showed restricted diffusion, suggestive of acute infarctions. Um, there was no hemorrhage. There was no pathological leptomeningeal enhancement. Time of flight MRA was carried out, showed significant thinning of the A1 and A2 segments, distal segments not visualized, no significant stenosis in the rest of vessels. So here are the images. So these are diffusion weighted imaging. And as you can see, 
uh, areas in the cerebellum bilaterally. Uh, and then also uh, in the uh, hemispheres, you can see scattered areas almost in a watershed pattern um, uh, noticed bilaterally, uh, slight predilection towards the right compared to the left. On flare imaging, I just wanted to um, show this image and we'll come back to this later, that there was areas of T2 confluence uh, uh, changes, uh, which you can see, which are involving cortex and also coming down into the subcortical white matter. This was her MRA at the time. And as you can see, overall, the proximal vessels look okay. Uh, however, at the MCA bifurcation, there's some attenuation of the vessels. Um, however, you know, within the realm of MRA sensitivity, uh, this was at the time called um, with it probably within normal limits or artifact of imaging. The patient's MRV was normal. She underwent echocardiography for the stroke, which was normal. Uh, as I said, no underlying vascular risk factors. A1C was normal. LDL was slightly elevated. Um, COVID testing at the time uh, on a repetitive basis was negative. Because of the weight loss, she underwent CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, and briefly, nothing remarkable standing out except for uh, some hypoplasia of the adrenal glands and the previously noted ureteric pathology. There was some thickening of the gastro or gastric wall, and this was pursued with endoscopy and biopsy, and it did not reveal anything, uh, just some nonspecific gastritis. So at the time, um, a DSA was carried out as well, and visualized major vessels are mildly tortuous, showing mild atherosclerotic changes. This is the report. Uh, mild irregularity seen in distal branches of both PCAs could be secondary to atherosclerotic changes, possibility of vasculitis is less likely, no filling defects. So after this, uh, the diagnosis, the presumptive diagnosis at the time was ESA, so embolic stroke of unknown source. The patient was started on Xarelto and atorvastatin and subsequently discharged. The patient though continued to rapidly deteriorate over four weeks. And at that point, a second opinion was sought and she was brought to our institution. When we first saw her, she was minimally responsive. She did have brainstem reflexes in, intact. She overall was in an akinetic spastic quadriparetic state with diffuse hyperreflexia. So this is the MRI scan that we carried out. And this is the first one we have. So uh, the top here, um, we have uh, areas of restricted diffusion, which are also showing uh, uh, restricted diffusion and ADC map. Um, these are the flare changes, and you can see that there's some confluence of these flare changes. And when T1 with contrast did show enhancement, and initially this was called that these could be subacute strokes and enhancing, but I'd like to uh, uh, focus your attention to some of the nodularity that is noticed back here, as well as this nodularity within the cortex that you can see in some of these legion, lesions. This was the MRA that we did. Now, in comparison to the prior MRA, we felt that, okay, previously the distal vessels were likely attenuated, um, and here they look a little bit better, but you know there could be difference between imaging modalities and from machine to machine. Uh, but we did also carry out MRI brain with vessel wall imaging, looking for enhancement. Uh, and the MRI brain vessel wall imaging did not show any areas of abnormal enhancement within the uh, proximal vessels. Um, as, as you may know, MRI brain vessel wall uh, imaging is increasingly being used to look for inflammatory versus non-inflammatory vasculopathies to try and differentiate between them, but the sensitivity of this falls off as we go into the distal blood vessels. She underwent uh, transthoracic echo TEE, which were normal, as well as CSF analysis, which was completely normal. By the way, this was also carried out at the external facility and repeat hypercoagulable and autoimmune screening was negative. Uh, we reviewed the external DSA uh, through an online platform. Unfortunately, I don't have those images available to show, but we felt that there was attenuation of the terminal vessels. So at this point in time, we decided to proceed with stereotactic brain biopsy uh, of one of the right frontal enhancing lesion. And this revealed cortex with rare intravascular atypical cells that were CD20 positive, uh, uh, proliferating, suggestive of intravascular lymphoma. Uh, there was no evidence of vasculitis associated with this lesion. 
there was beta amyloid positivity though in diffuse plaques, but negative within the vessels. And this is just a, an example to illustrate. So H&E staining, and then we can see the CD20 uh, lymphocytes in an intravascular uh, uh, portion as uh, consistent with evidence of intravascular lymphoma. So at this point in time, a treatment was initiated. Um, we started, uh, we actually had to collaborate with our colleagues at an oncology center here in the UAE. Um, and the patient was uh, underwent PET scan. No other signs of systemic illness were seen. She underwent int intrathecal methotrexate followed by RCHOP for six cycles. Her PET scan improved. Uh, however, upon repeat examination and evaluation a couple of months ago, she still had a very poor clinical state, uh, modified rank and scale of five. She has retained level of consciousness, but is akinetic and most days is mute. And this is her most recent follow-up MRI scan. As you can see on T1 with contrast, the prior areas of involvement have basically burned out. We have large areas of um, black holes, uh, but on the periphery, you can see nodular enhancement that is still there. This nodular enhancement had been stable, but as there had been no clinical sequelae related to this, and because of um, uh, you know, the intensity of the chemotherapy, right now additional chemotherapy is on hold. So CNS intravascular lymphoma, it's a rare subtype of diffuse extranodal large B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is relatively rare, but it's not unheard of, and it does have a predilection for the CNS. There's intraluminal uh, proliferation of neoplastic lymphoid cells, and it typically affects the small and medium vessels of the CNS. The spectrum of manifestations is usually cognitive decline, uh, dementia, rapidly progressive dementia, headache, seizures, but you can also have stuttering symptoms that look like stroke-like episodes. So how does one reach a diagnosis? I think first and foremost, you need to have a high index of suspicion. Younger age, though it can present later in life in the 50s and 60s, but the absence of vascular risk factors, um, stuttering symptoms with progressive cognitive decline. Some patients can have an atypical skin rash and actually even in patients without evidence of rash, uh, when they undergo biopsy in up to 80% of patients, you may find involvement of skin. Adrenal enlargement can be a tip off, but one of the big MRI findings that we need to focus on and which was present in our case in retrospect is the presence of confluent white matter lesions. And so if we look at these MRI changes, so um, this is the first scan on the left is the first uh, flare uh, sequence that was done in a coronal fashion from the external uh, scan back in uh, the original scan in September of 2020. Um, and then this is the follow-up scan uh, on the right in our institution by February. And you can see this predilection for kind of a, a T2 confluence that is happening almost in the border zone areas, um, but can also involve cortex. And whenever you see those type of findings, uh, you have to have a high index of suspicion, especially if there is no uh, vascular risk factors. And unless you have a high index of suspicion, this is what you're gonna end up with. So as the disease progressed, um, there's areas of burnout, but that uh, T2 uh, changes, the confluence kind of expanded over time. I just wanted to, as an interventionalist, uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, offer our two cents on angiography, um, especially when you're considering um, um, such a diagnosis of CNS uh, intravascular lymphoma. You have to remember it typically involves the very small branches and um, you have to have a, a trained eye, high index of suspicion to be looking for this. I can tell you, I'm pointing at a vessel here that looks attenuated but that, that, that was discovered in hindsight. Uh, a lot of times a vessel this size uh, may just be overlooked uh, as was in this particular case. So a DSA can be read as normal. And maybe even the DSA is completely normal because the, ves the, the, the vessels involved are very small. So the gold standard for diagnosis is biopsy. And however, sometimes it's carried out too late. And, uh, and actually a lot of case series, uh, the diagnosis is made in, on autopsy. In one case series, I saw it was up to 50% of cases. 
So unfortunately, most of the times the diagnosis is delayed and uh, or it's postmortem. The treatment has been standardized, a uh, review of the oncological literature. The standard treatment is a combination of RCHOP with intrathecal methotrexate. Um, there are uh, other protocols that have been explored, uh, methotrexate followed by XRT. Um, however, the survivability has not been seen as the same. Uh, and one interesting treatment protocol that I saw in, in, involved unfractionated heparin. And the CD20 proliferated cells apparently can develop uh, molecules on their surface that bind with heparin. So they have a, these adhesive mo molecules that bind with heparin. So when unfractionated heparin is combined with treatment, apparently the response can be even better. But obviously this has to be uh, taken into account because some patients may also have hemorrhage as a presentation, but we have to take that into account and discuss this with an oncologist when we're treating these patients. So what's the take home message? Um, atypical stroke with a progressive decline, atypical MRI findings, nodular enhancement. Uh, our, our neuroradiologists really hammered home the message with regards to nodular enhancement in stroke, uh, white matter confluence lesions. Um, remember, angiographic findings may be non-diagnostic and high index of suspicion to pursue an early brain biopsy. The disease can go into remission. However, the neurological recovery depends on the extent of injury. So uh, unless it's picked up well and treated aggressively up front, um, we may put the disease into remission as is the case for our patient, but the degree of neurological disability may be irreversible. So I'll stop right there um, uh, and um, I'll be happy to take questions. I, I believe I'll defer to the panel. Maybe we're taking questions at the end of the talks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Itesa, for this interesting uh, case. Yeah, it would be um, better to discuss everything at the end. Um, and I, I have the pleasure to invite the second speaker who's taking up a very interesting topic. Um, Dr. Sebi John um, is a vascular neurologist and neurointervascular uh, surgeon, <clears throat> also at the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. Uh, he completed his neurological training, uh, including neurology residency, vascular neurology fellowship, and endovascular surgical neuroradiology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Subsequently, he joined the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi as a consultant neurologist in 2018. He is currently clinical associate professor of neurology at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine in uh, Ohio, Cleveland, and adjunct clinical associate professor of neurology at Khalifa University College of Medicine in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. John has extensive experience in the medical and interventional management of cerebrovascular disease. He's an active researcher and has been an investigator in numerous international cerebrovascular clinical trials. Uh, he has, to his credit, more than 60 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters in the field of stroke and neurointerventional uh, uh, surgery. And uh, he is uh, on the board of directors of the MENA Sino Middle East North Africa Stroke and Interventional Neurotherapeutics Organization um, and the UAE Vascular Neurology Chair for the Mission Thrombectomy 2020 Plus. He's an active reviewer for multiple journals and is on the editorial board of clinical neurology and neurosurgery. Um, Dr. Sebi uh, is uh, talking about the endovascular management of cerebral uh, venous sinus thrombosis. And I'm very interested to hear uh, what he has to say. Dr. Sebi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Krieger for the kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Suhail, for giving us the opportunity. We're very honored. And I see your participants has crossed 1,000, which is amazing. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, thank you. So I do not have any relevant disclosures. I'll stick to the case-based presentation, uh, but I would like to show you a, a, a few cases uh, to give you a sense of uh, the complexity of this disease and how variable it, it can be. So the first case is a 20-year-old, very healthy Indian gentleman 
uh, who uh, had a history of five days of severe headache. And uh, he kept presented to our emergency room with uh, seizures. He was actively seizing and he went on uh, to be refractory seizures and subsequently into status epilepticus. Uh, his examination, when he came in, he had a GCS of eight by 15. Uh, cranial nerves, his pupils were reactive, uh, no focal deficits that we could identify prior to his intubation. And his CT scan was uh, as seen below. Uh, this is a non contrasted head CT, and you can see large areas of uh, hyperdensity, which are seen on the non contrast CT along the left transverse sinus. Uh, you can see along the straight sinus, and here in the very high uh, superior sagittal sinus and the draining uh, veins. Uh, I can tell you that the CT venogram was done at this point, and it showed extensive thrombosis uh, involving the uh, superior sagittal sinus, bilateral transverse and sigmoid sinus, uh, and even the straight sinus. So the patient was intubated. He was started on anti-epileptics, uh, immediately started on IV unfractionated heparin, uh, including a bolus, and subsequently continued on an infusion therapeutic dose. Uh, this was a follow-up MRI, also on day zero. And you can see the extensive areas of loss of the uh, sinus filling. And again, you can see this is the AP and lateral, the superior sagittal sinus, uh, bilateral transverse. Uh, you can see a little bit of the sigmoid over here, but essentially a case with extensive thrombosis. So he was with therapeutic anticoagulation for 48 hours as documented by therapeutic PTTs. Uh, he was not having any clinical seizures, and the EEG confirmed that there was no electrographic seizures, uh, but the patient did not improve. At the end of 48 hours, he also started to have some focality with more left-sided weakness, and his GCS was about the same, maybe even worse, uh, to a 7. So an MRI was repeated, and uh, uh, you can see this is a diffusion-weighted image, and this is the corresponding ADC, and he was starting to develop infarct. Uh, this is a flare where you can see the hyperintensity. And the last is the, the SWI sequence where there is still no hemorrhage, but in this gentleman, he's developing ischemic infarcts. So what would be your next step? Uh, just keep this in your mind and I'll come back to these cases. Case number two, uh, this is a Pakistani gentleman. He was healthy, 51. Uh, he did have some pneumonia two months back, unknown whether it was COVID and he presents with three days of uh, headache and visual impairment. This was at an outside hospital where they did a CT and he had superior sagittal, right transverse and sigmoid sinus thrombosis. And at that time, he had a right parietal occipital venous infarct. I don't have these images. Uh, he was started on therapeutic uh, anticoagulation, this time with low molecular weight. They chose anoxaparin and he was doing okay. But on the fourth day of therapeutic anticoagulation, he became worse. He got agitated, left-sided weakness. His exam was a GCS of 13, slightly uh, confused. Uh, he was cortically blind and he had my left-sided hemiparesis. So this was when he got to us. I remember that he has been on therapeutic anticoagulation for four days uh, with right transverse sigmoid and superior sagittal sinus. And here you can see the venous infarction, the edema, and now you can see a new area of hemorrhage in here. And you can also see that he's starting to develop some hypodensity on the contralateral side, uh, the left side, which probably explains why he's cortically blind. Just another cut showing these uh, uh, same things. So it's four days therapeutic anticoagulation. What would you with this gentleman? Third case, this is a 50 year old gentleman. He's healthy, a Filipino gentleman, two weeks of headache, uh, and on the day of presentation to the emergency room, he had right-sided weakness. He was absolutely intact in terms of GCS, 15 out of 15, but he had very mild drift on the right hand. This is a non-contrast head CT. Uh, you can see uh, uh, the high sagittal sinus. There is a hyperdensity also including the cortical veins. And if you look carefully enough, you see there's something going on over here in the left posterior frontal lobe, uh, probably some edema. Uh, a CT venogram was done as part of, you know, our routine stroke protocol also involves a delayed image and again showed extensive sinus thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus uh, and bilateral transverse sigmoid sinuses. The deep sinuses were spared. Right in the emergency itself, 60 minutes later, he starts to have a, a new seizure. It was focal with secondary generalization. 
And thereafter, he became extremely agitated. His airway was being compromised and he had to be intubated. Uh, he was, of course, loaded with uh, anti-epileptics. So this is a scenario where it's a fresh presentation, uh, very early deterioration, not started on anticoagulation, and he's bled. What would you do in this case? And the last case I want to say is a 29-year-old female who's six weeks pregnant, and she's been feeling a little unwell one week prior to presentation. Uh, she's not been eating well, some nausea, vomiting, no headache. And she presented to an outside hospital with multiple seizures. They documented extensive sinus thrombosis of the uh, superior sagittal bilateral transfers. She was started on enoxaparin. Uh, she was transferred fairly quick to us. She got to us within six hours. Her exam when she came uh, was a GCS3. Uh, her pupils were sluggishly reactive, but they were reactive for sure. And this was her CT. Uh, so this is fairly on in the course. This is about eight hours since eight, eight to 10 hours on presentation. And you can see this brain looks very angry. There's a lot of edema. Um, uh, you can see hypodensities in the posterior fossa. Uh, so what would you do in this case? So these are four cases I would like to keep in mind as we'll go through the discussion as I quickly review uh, uh, cerebral sinus venous thrombosis. So uh, the epidemiology, you have to remember CVST is a rare condition. If you're considering a condition like ischemic stroke, CVT is extremely rare. And uh, we don't have very good studies. Most of it is from Europe and Australia, uh, and the incidence is likely underestimated. So for instance, in Netherlands, the incidence is about 1.32 per 100,000 per year. And uh, women uh, certainly higher, 2.78. Uh, and in and, and, uh, women, of course, uh, the periods of susceptibility are all peripartum. Uh, in this U.S. registry, you can see that the increase of uh, CBT during pregnancy is 11.6 per 100,000. And this is fairly uh, reflective in most case series uh, where CBT is more common in women and peripartum is a significant risk. And add to that, of course, OCPs. Having said this, um, incidence rates are much higher from documented series coming from India or the Middle East or Latin America, and probably has uh, a lot to do with demographics, social cultural factors, so all this have to be kept in mind. Compare this to ischemic stroke, and you will see the difference. Uh, we are talking about one is to 100. So it's a very rare condition. So it affects young people. Uh, the median age is about 37, but younger for females. You can see women were 34 as compared to men. And there are very few people who are uh, older than 65 who get this problem. Uh, female to male ratio is about three is to one. And if you're looking at pediatric population, uh, certainly more common in neonates. Um, so just a very brief uh, uh, touching upon the anatomy. So there are, uh, the venous anatomy can be extremely uh, variable. So this has to be kept in mind uh, in, in sharp contrast to arterial anatomy, which is usually constant. So if you look at the superficial, you have the large dural sinuses, uh, the superior transfer sigmoid, and uh, there can be variability in the cortical drain veins. The deep system is relatively constant, and the posterior fossa, again, there can be a lot of variability in how uh, the venous system drains our head. But if you look at the patterns of venous infarction, so this uh, is pointing to the superficial middle cerebral vein. This is the vein of la Bay or transfer sinus. And then, of course, this is the superior sagittal sinus. If you go deep, um, uh, this is the deep cerebral veins, and then you see the medullary and subependymal veins. So a very different pattern compared to arterial territories. But even among this, there can be a lot of variability depending on which vein is draining and how there's redundancy in the system. So briefly, this is the pathophysiology. So if you have an obstruction of a sinus and there is increased venous pressure, there's two components to this. One is that there is decreased absorption of CSF because the sinuses are, uh, are, are clotted off and that increases intracranial pressure. But a lot more happens on the other side when the, uh, when the venulary and capillary pressure are increased and that is a whole cascade of events which happen. So um, uh, the capillary perfusion, this cascade, you'll go on to have cytotoxic edema. If there's disruption of the blood-brain barrier, you get vasogenic edema. But I have to say that vasogenic edema is a lot more common than cytotoxic edema. And usually, if you're able to recanalize the vessel, 
the vasogenic edema uh, is reversible. And uh, at the last stage, if the venous and capillary pressure is too much, then it bursts, and that's when you get a parenchymal hemorrhage. So I'm not going. I'm not uh, not going to touch upon what is the etiological workup, etiologies, uh, diagnosis. Uh, uh, but I would like to focus on treatment, which is broadly uh, uh, classified as antithrombotic treatments, what you do for symptomatic treatment, and then the etiological treatment. Symptomatic treatment, of course, is anti-epileptics, you know, uh, ICP management, decompression, uh, those things. But the other two, so what about antithrombotics? So both the American and European guidelines do agree that in the acute phase, you need to use heparin. So this is either low molecular weight heparin or intravenous heparin in therapeutic doses. And then after that, you transition to oral uh, anticoagulants. And the duration, although all this is not, uh, what shall I say, it's not evidence-based, but uh, a lot of it is consensus-based. Uh, the duration of treatment uh, depends on whether there's a transient risk factor uh, or there is severe hereditary uh, thrombophilia. So anywhere from three to six months, some clinicians use imaging to uh, help you guide treatment. But usually six to uh, three to six months if it's transient, six to 12 months, uh, and then lifelong if it is severe. So what are the choices? This is all based on two European trials and two Indian randomized control trials, uh, but the evidence is not so strong. They've done systematic reviews after that. And uh, there's this one data set, which is called the ICC, ISCVT, which has a large group of 600 patients. And uh, uh, the consensus is low molecular weight heparin was slightly better than unfractionated heparin. There was better outcomes, lower hemorrhage. And this is also if there is patients who have intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid. So we, we don't withhold anticoagulation in these patients. And there's uh, not much data for the use of antiplatelets in CVT. So what about outcomes? So this registry with IC, uh, ISCVT, uh, a lot of patients do very well, up to 80% to recover completely. But there's up to 13% of patients who uh, are dead or dependent. Uh, so certainly room for, uh, for improving treatment because a, a, a not a small portion of patients uh, do have severe disability or die. And these are the predictors of long-term prognosis, which are fairly consistent through most of the series. If you have a deep uh, CVT, if you have hemorrhage uh, on presentation, if your GCS is less than nine, if you have altered mental status, uh, age older than 37 and male gender. These are predictors of long-term poor prognosis and predictors of mortality at 30 days uh, kind of shared the same factors, uh, depressed consciousness, uh, thrombosis of deep cerebral system, uh, posterior force adhesion. So um, these are uh, things that you can look at to see how your patient is going to proceed. Uh, through the course of uh, hospitalization to see if there is a, a, a high-risk CVT. So what is the role of endovascular treatment? So uh, uh, is this just a heroic treatment uh, that we are going to use, or is there some data for its use? Uh, I can say that most places now generally reserve endovascular treatment as a last-ditch effort uh, when um, anticoagulation is failing. But are they, what are the circumstances we can use it in? So there's clinical deterioration or progression of the venous infarction or ICH despite therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, if the mental status uh, presentation is severe stupor or comatose presentations, if there's deep CVTs, uh, posterior fossa involvement, or there are major contraindications to anticoagulation. So either thrombocytopenia or recent GI hemorrhages. These are circumstances where you can consider uh, endovascular treatment. So what are we talking about? So uh, there are many different ways and methods we can achieve uh, endovascular treatment. So let's minimize this. So a lot of this is borrowing from uh, ischemic stroke. So in, in ADAPT technique, basically we have these large bore aspiration catheters, which we snake up to the face of the clot, and then we apply suction to the clot. And uh, uh, this will recanalize the sinus by progressive suctioning clot out. Uh, this is also borrowing from ischemic stroke where we use stent levers, which, is the, which has been a game changer in ischemic stroke, where we use these retrievable stents uh, to catch the clot and then pull it out. Uh, you can use intrasinus 
thrombolysis. So um, the thrombolysis with different agents uh, has been used uh, for quite a while now, uh, where we give uh, within the sinus boluses of uh, thrombolytics, or we do long-term uh, the catheter in place uh, for about 12 to 24 hours and slowly infuse uh, the thrombolytic. So the usual ones used are urokinase or alterplase, and alterplase anywhere in the dose of 0.5 to 2 milligram per hour for 12 to 24 hours. Um, there is this device called AngioJet, which is basically a very high speed uh, saline jets which come out from the distal tip of the catheter. And there's another port through which you can aspirate. So um, uh, using the AngioJet, uh, you disrupt the clot using the high velocity jets, and then you also uh, aspirate through the port. And then uh, the last one is shown over here. So uh, sometimes in refractory cases, we can blow up a balloon and then just drag the clot down while aspirating. Uh, and this has been used in a uh, case series. A lot of times we use Fogarty balloons, but other balloons also have been used. So these are the different types of uh, techniques we can use for endovascular thrombectomy. What is Is the goal? The goal is to achieve some sort of weight in these cases, but even if we achieve heparin to work, increases the contact surface area for the heparin to work, and then reestablish anterograde venous flow in the targeted sinus, and consequently are reducing the venous pressure, the venous congestion, and therefore its uh, associated complications. But the important questions are, does EVT improve functional outcome? So there are numerous single center case series which have assessed uh, safety and efficacy. Um, this is one series uh, or systematic review of 185 patients from 42 studies, which was published in 2015. And these were fairly severe cases. So there were 60% with ICH, 47% uh, with uh, severe presentations uh, in terms of mental status. And they reported a very good outcome, uh, MRS of 0 to 2 in 84. There's a more recent one from 2017, which included 237 patients and again, patients who got some sort of endovascular therapy, up to 76% of them had good outcomes. But uh, in terms of randomized control data, we have just this one trial, which is called the TWOACT trial, which was published in 2020 and presented slightly earlier. Um, so this trial uh, wanted to assess the efficient, uh, efficacy and safety of endovascular therapy in patients with severe forms of CBT. Uh, it was done in Portugal, Netherlands, and China between 2011 and 16, and it had to be CVT cases with at least one risk factor for a poor outcome. So they stuck with mental status disorder, uh, severe presentations with coma, ICH, they did not define ICH, um, or thrombosis of the deep venous system. Uh, so you got EVT versus uh, EVT plus standard medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. Uh, and this had to be done within 24 hours of randomization. And the good outcome they chose was MRS of 0 to 1 at 12 months. So two things I want to draw your attention is uh, the time frame was 2011 and 16. Uh, the devices we used uh, have significantly improved since that time. And they did choose an outcome of MRS 0 to 1. So what did we find? So this was the primary outcome. Uh, I have to draw your attention to the number of patients. So this is 33, uh, 33 and 34. So not many patients in both groups. Uh, there was hard time enrolling patients over the uh, seven years. But essentially what it showed that at 12 months, there was no difference in outcome, whether you used EVT with standard therapy versus standard therapy alone. So the graphs look pretty much the same in both groups. Uh, what about safety? And none of these numbers were significant, but of note, there was more mortality in the EVT-related group. Uh, however, inversely, there was less numerical ICHs in the EVT-treated group, although both mortality and uh, ICH did not meet statistical significance. If you look at the secondary endpoints, uh, what about if you take MRS 0 to 2, or what about if you assess it earlier? Uh, there was no difference. So if you look at uh, any dichotomization of MRS at two time points, 12 month or six month, there was no difference between the two groups. But what was interesting was there were certainly higher rates of recanalization 
in the EVT group compared to the standard medical therapy. However, this study did not assess recanalization uh, immediately after the procedure or short term. This was assessed at six or 12 months. But at any rate, the recanalization was higher uh, at uh, uh, long term follow up in the EVT group. So, um, this study, they said there was no difference, but of course, uh, this is not categorically proved that you know, EVT does not help. Uh, there were many, many criticisms, uh, very small numbers. Uh, they could not do subgroup analysis uh, in terms of categories like ICH, ICH presentations, uh, deep uh, CVT, or uh, severe presentations like coma, uh, because the numbers were just too small. And uh, the devices we have now are a lot better at recanalizing sinuses. So is there a, 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 a limitation with the devices which were used early on in the trial? So multiple factors like this, but uh, to their credit, uh, well-run trial and the only randomized control data that we have. So what is the safety of EVT? So majority of the single center case series, uh, the, the safety is underreported. But the two-act trial uh, reported three out of 39 patients uh, where there was a perforation, where there was a bleed. And this is likely because of perforation of a cortical wing. A lot of times when we do this procedure, it's blind. Uh, so the wire could certainly go into a cortical vein and uh, perforate it. But interestingly, none of the patients in whom a perforation occurred developed symptomatic ICH. And possible uh, an explanation is that the veins are full of clot uh, and the perforations occurred at the beginning of the procedure when you know things were still occluded. But by and large, uh, the case series do report that it is a fairly safe procedure. So should we do endovascular thrombectomy in conjunction with intrasinus thrombolysis? So uh, we do not know. Uh, is there a concern for ICH if we use intrasinus thrombolysis? So at least from the data we have from the systematic reviews, uh, new or increased ICH was seen in 10% of all the cases, uh, but they were not that much different between the two groups. So this happened in 7% of patients who underwent EVT alone versus slightly higher in those who got intrasinus thrombolysis also. Uh, but this was not statistically significant. Uh, and the answer is we do not know yet. Uh, what are the limitations of endovascular thrombectomy? So, of course, uh, we can go into mostly the big sinuses. So, these are the superior sagittal sinus or the transverse sigmoid, uh, maybe even the straight sinus, but uh, we do not get into the cortical veins or the deep venous system. Uh, so, our thrombectomy efforts are limited to these big sinuses. Uh, there are a lot of other questions uh, which we do not know about uh, thrombectomy, uh, which particularly uh, go around the fact of when do we choose our patients? What is the uh, duration of therapeutic anticoagulation? Before we say uh, therapeutic anticoagulation is a failure, how long do we wait? So I presented a couple of scenarios. Is that failure of medical management and should we pursue EVT? What about ICH presentations? Should we do EVT alone, endovascular thrombectomy, or should we uh, leave a catheter in there and infuse thrombolytics? Uh, what about patients with large parenchymal lesions uh, with uh, impending herniation? When do we choose hemicraniectomy over EVT? Or how do we combine hemicraniectomy and EVT in these patients with severe thrombosis? So a lot of questions still uh, remain with endovascular management of uh, CVT. So I'm just getting back to the cases. So case one was a young gentleman on therapeutic anticoagulation who had ischemic stroke without hemorrhage despite being on 48 hours of anticoagulation. So we decided uh, that he was not improving. He had a fair trial of anticoagulation and took him for thrombectomy. So this is the baseline uh, baseline uh, angiograms, the AP and a lateral view. And you can see uh, quite sparse filling of the sinuses, um, uh, including the superior sagittal, the bilateral transverse. So this is an idea of how we do it. So our axis is from the right jugular, and then uh, I've gone all around uh, the sigmoid transverse on the right, crossing over to the transverse on the left, all the way down to the sigmoid. And in this case, I used aspiration to clean up this. And then we went to the superior sagittal sinus. So this is an AP and a lateral. And you can see the wires all the way down to the anterior third of the superior sagittal sinus with the catheter to follow. 
in this case, I did not use intrasinus thrombolysis. We just did aspiration thrombectomy uh, with only partial recanalization. Uh, but this was enough for the patient. Uh, he actually improved significantly, extubated the next day, and he was discharged in 10 days without uh, any deficits. He made a complete recovery. Case two was a patient with four days of therapeutic anticoagulation and he developed a bleed. Uh, again, we thought it was a fair trial of anticoagulation and he worsened despite that. So he was taken for mechanical thrombectomy. I'm not showing you all the pictures, but showing you some technical difficulties. So this was a right-sided parieto oxidable bleed with right transfer sigmoid thrombosis. So of course, uh, ideally we would have wanted to uh, recanalize uh, the right transverse going in from the right side, but this is the jugular vein on the right side. So it was completely occluded and there was no access to uh, the right uh, system from the right side. So we had to go in from the left. And this was our initial venogram. So you can see the pre, the, uh, the left transverse is just a, a string and there's no filling in the right transverse. So again, cleaned up the left transverse with aspiration thrombectomy, and then cleaned up some of the right transverse. Again, have to point that this was not a complete, uh, it was a partial recanalization. Uh, I took the catheter up to the superior sagittal sinus and gave some intrasinus thrombolytics with alterplase. It was just a bolus without uh, an infusion. And this patient stabilized very well. So he left with no visual complaints, but very mild weakness on the, uh, on, the, on the left side. He was discharged in about two weeks. This was the case three was a patient who had the hyperacute bleed while he was in the emergency room uh, without starting any anticoagulation. So uh, we immediately started anticoagulation despite the bleed, uh, including a bolus of heparin. And then we decided to take him for thrombectomy. I'm not showing you the thrombectomy fissures. Uh, we, we did a complete uh, a recanalization and we gave a small bolus of TPA within the sinus. But after the procedure, this patient uh, extended his bleed. So if you remember the first pictures, uh, he certainly extended his bleed and he went on to require a decompression. Uh, he had a stormy course. He had status epilepticus, uh, required a tracheostomy peg tube, but was discharged after a month. Uh, with an MRS of five. Uh, he is awake, but not following commands and severe right hemiplegia, but moving the left side. So this patient did worsen his bleed. And the last case, the pregnant woman who came in, uh, it was a severe presentation as a last ditch effort. We thought we'll give her a chance. We took her for angiogram, and this was the angiogram pictures where she had severe raised intracranial pressure, which shows up on these pictures where there's very slow filling of the blood vessels and non-filling of a large portion of the cerebral hemisphere. Uh, so this patient, uh, of course, we couldn't do anything. We did not perform any further thrombectomy, and uh, she herniated and passed away. Um, so in conclusion, uh, endovascular thrombectomy for CVST is feasible, is feasible and it is reasonably safe. I, I don't think it's a heroic measure in centers who have good experience and a good volume of patients. I think it can be used uh, uh, effectively, uh, but uh, patient selection is, uh, uh, is key and we don't have all the answers at this time. However, I would suggest using EVT in severe uh, sinus thrombosis cases when there's clinical deterioration despite anticoagulation or uh, their presentation with severe neurological deficits or coma. Having said that, uh, CVT is a very rare problem. Severe presentations of CVT are even more rare. Therefore, routine use of EVT is not justified and needn't be employed in a majority of cases. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sebi, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I think um, both presenters uh, uh, really um, presented uh, extremely challenging cases. And uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of questions um, that have uh, emerged. And uh, um, maybe what we should do is we should start um, discussing uh, Irtesa's case.
Um, and what we should also do is maybe we should uh, discuss as the panelists and, and read some of the questions of, uh, of uh, overall interest uh, that were uh, placed by the participants because we have now 1,200 people and uh, we would like to keep this uh, educational. So, um, so hey, uh, do you want to start yeah. with the questions yeah. for Dr. Itesa? Yes, so first thanks for both uh, speaker about uh, these cases. Uh, just for the audience, these are a very rare condition that they will see it. And that's the beauty of working with the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I remember uh, the only case, uh, Dr. Teza, that I saw with the large B cell intravascular was in Montreal in 2009 or 8, where a patient presented similar to your case. Uh, progressive neurological de deterioration. At the beginning, we thought about dementia, but when the scan has been done, CT, MRI, she had these multiple nodular, uh, there's an echo, sorry, multiple, uh, multiple uh, lo uh, nodular shape, uh, uh, acute stroke involving white matter, gray matter, uh, but she was progressive dementia. Is your patient had the same thing? Uh, or it was different than usual neurological presentation uh, with uh, acute stroke presentation that we have? Absolutely. So it was a co progressive cognitive decline. So very similar patient, but superimposed upon that was these sudden deterioration with gait. And yes. when they saw those cerebellar strokes, they were thinking, you know, maybe she showered emboli. So they were thinking of more of a vascular dementia, multiple recurrent strokes, is what their initial impression was. Yeah. Interesting, because it's very weird why uh, with these multiple nodular type of ischemia that it's not acute weakness or acute aphasia. What they're having is the family would bring them with this progressive dementia that she's, uh, and my patient had later uh, stage seizure, then she passed away because of that. But um, uh, I will say it's very challenging case to get the diagnosis without the biopsy. So uh, there's a few questions that uh, we can start with. And I think both of you read some of these questions. Some of them are relative. One of the audience asked why these are not a mycotic aneurysm, one of the differential diagnoses, Dr. Tiza. Uh, so that's a great question. I, I couldn't show the entire scans, but uh, there was no evidence of micro bleeds. So the GRE and susceptibility weighted imaging sequences were negative for micro hemorrhages. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, interestingly, uh, patients with intravascular lymphoma can also present with multiple hemorrhagic uh, lesions. And so that would be within the differential for, um, you know, uh, unusual uh, cerebrovascular events or unusual stroke. Uh, but in this instance, it was not consistent with mycotic aneurysms. But that's a good thought as it, for initial differential if you're thinking outside of the box. And uh, is one of your differential also primary or secondary CNS vasculitis in these cases, despite normal angio? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's always within the differential, and she was tested for that. Uh, and some people actually have lymphoma-induced vasculitis as well. They can coexist. Um, we've also seen amyloid-induced vasculitis. Uh, but uh, the, the pathological specimen was read at main campus in Cleveland, Ohio, and that's a very big center for CNS vasculitis. And they specifically looked for any concomitant vasculitis, and there was none. Um, so uh, this was a pure case of intravascular lymphoma. Interesting. Did, did she have other organ inv involvement, uh, involved with the B-cell lymphoma or it was just the CNS? So this was categorically just pure CNS lymphoma. Uh, <laughs> there is a predilection for the skin for intravascular lymphoma, adrenal glands, and sometimes some of the sex organs as well. But uh, overall, uh, a lot of times uh, it tends to hide within the CNS. And uh, you have to have a high index of suspicion. Uh, through my literature search, I saw that uh, part of the diagnostics of brain biopsy is not readily available. A random skin biopsy, even of asymptomatic, just normal looking skin should be carried out because that can actually pick up uh, cases of latent intravascular lymphoma in up to 80% of patients. So, um, but uh, intravascular lymphoma can uh, involve other uh, organs. 
And intravascular lymphoma can also be within the context of CNS lymphoma. Mm -hmm. uh, this patient on pathological analysis did not show any primary CNS lymphoma. It was uh, exclusively within the intravascular comp compartment. And uh, you mentioned about the, uh, sorry, last question about the methotrexate. One of the questions from Dr. Manal, is there any rule for steroid in the management of these cases? Absolutely. So whenever you're entertaining a possibility of, uh, you know, an inflammatory process affecting the cerebrovasculature and you're thinking about vasculitis, uh, the classic teaching is don't give steroids, get a biopsy because if it's lymphoma, it's going to shrink it, right? Uh, but we just felt so bad for this particular patient. When she arrived to us, she had been devastated neurologically. Uh, this had been going on already for three months that we opted to start steroids initially. Uh, and we, by the second day of steroids, she underwent the, the brain biopsy. Mm -hmm. So I would say it happened in tandem. Uh, but the classic teaching is if you can delay the steroids, then you should. And then, as you know, the R chop, the P in the chop is actually prednisolone. So she was maintained on steroids uh, afterwards. Thank you. Dr. Deck. Um, yes, I mean, this is obviously, uh, as you pointed out, um, a burned out case at the time when she showed up uh, at your institution. Uh, if she would have been uh, diagnosed earlier uh, on a higher rate of suspicion, uh, this might have been different. Um, my question is, and you already said a little bit about this, um, in, in endo, uh, endovascular, intervascular lymphoma can be associated with uh, a, a CNS lymphoma. In this case, it was not. Why was MTX uh, intrathecal therapy chosen if it is a truly intervascular disease? Yes, yeah, so... So uh, that's why, and I, I will obviously defer to my oncology specialists, but uh, my review of the literature is that um, the response rate for primary intravascular lymphoma is better with concomitant uh, methotrexate or cytarabine. And so um, um, I think that's mainly an oncology-based decision. I'm wondering if they were considering, um, because this was brought to our attention, they were concerned that we had started steroids already and maybe we had uh, diminished any concomitant CNS lymphoma. Um, and so I think that was their uh, rationale and that's the re reason they pursued that. Yeah. Was this done uh, with a reservoir or with a repeated intrathecal uh, lumbar punctures? I believe it was done through re repetitive punctures. She does not have an intrathecal uh, reservoir. Yeah, amazing case. Uh, I'm just thinking of, um, uh, you know, the question from Dr. Manal, uh, and you also echoed this. Uh, um, Martin Samuels, we probably all know him from the Brigham and Women. His, uh, his opening statement is always, a patient should never leave. A complicated, complex patient should never leave a neurologist <laughs> without a steroid. <laughs> so I think this applies to, to this case as well. Um, so um, are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions for uh, Irtesa um, from the audience. I think um, this is an amazing case. Uh, congratulations uh, again and uh, wonderful presentation. So maybe we can uh, swing over now uh, and, uh, and grill Sebi. <laughs> Ready. Because he, he, has a, he has a very, very... Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, one thing I don't like is you said there's no evidence, uh, there's only consent. Uh, you, I mean, consensus among specialists is also evidence. I mean, it's just a lower level of evidence. And, uh, and you didn't show us any evidence, you know, because the, the, the trials that were done, not only the endovascular, but also the ones for heparin, in particular, the one, remember, from uh, Dr. Einhäupel from Munich from 1990-something, I mean, what kind of a trial was that? Uh, this was not a, um, a trial uh, with the quality that we have uh, today. So I think we, we really, we, we still don't have um, very good data. And so we depend on, um, you know, people who see these cases a lot. And I really liked your uh, case uh, approach because that's all we have. And I do not remember all of those four cases, but it, it turned out that, again, um, earlier is better. 
so if you if you treat if you uh, identify these cases earlier, uh, then you might get away with things like uh, heparin or low molecular weight heparin if it is better. That might be the case. Um, but if it if it what is your what is your uh, personal um, threshold as to when you consider uh, you know going endovascular in a patient like this? Do they have to be comatose? Do they have to have status epilepticus? Or what is your personal uh, threshold, Sebi? Yeah, so uh, that's the whole reason why I presented those four cases because each of that. Unlike arterial strokes where you have an occlusion and, you know, things are pretty um, mostly straightforward, we struggle with this actually. Uh, although I presented these cases, the brainstorming which goes before each of these cases are, is quite difficult. So the answer for your question is, uh, I, I don't know, but if we truly have given them a good 48 to 72 hours of therapeutic anticoagulation, and they don't recover clinically as in the first case, you were still comatose, or they, despite that, start having bleed, I think that's a fair trial to, you know, consider endovascular options. Uh, we, Irtiza did a case just today and yesterday. This lady has GCS 15, and I sat on her, but every scan you do is worsening edema, worsening edema, worsening edema, and then we were like, you know, we have to do something, otherwise, you know, she's going to deteriorate, but Oftentimes, these answers are not so clear cut. So it depends on each institution and your comfort level with taking them. And of course, the support of a full neuroscience institute, including ICU, neurosurgery, for very, very careful uh, 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 management of these patients. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a question from the audience, uh, from Dr. Uh, Kufran. He's asking, what was the etiology in the cases that you showed? Did you find out? The first case one, uh, there was no etiology. I think he, he just landed. He started his job, was dehydrated. Case two was protein C and protein S deficiency. Uh, case three, we did not find any etiology. And case four, uh, probably, you know, uh, she was six weeks pregnant. So the hypercoagulability related to pregnancy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there's another question uh, from an uh, unidentified uh, uh, attendee uh, is asking, uh, what is your opinion uh, on, um, on endovascular thrombectomy in aged patients, so in elderly patients? Uh, arterial or venous? It doesn't say. I would, I would say venous. That was your presentation. I, I would still stick or by... Maybe you give, uh, us, give, us, give us your, 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 um, or both. your experience on both, because I think it happens, uh, is of more significance in the arterial tree. So why don't okay, you... Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the arterial. Uh, we have very strong uh, uh, data as, um, in sharp contrast to the venous side. On the arterial, we have plenty of randomized control trials. And no matter how you slice it or dice it, no matter what subgroup you take, endovascular thrombectomy helps almost every group, even including the elderly. So uh, the patients even above 80 or 90, I would say they would benefit from endovascular thrombectomy. On the venous side, um, it's usually much more rarer. Like I said, there's only about 8% uh, in the patients over 65 years of age. Uh, but I would probably use the same principles if they are not responding to medical therapy. Uh, I would try to salvage using endovascular. Can, can I ask you, um, Sebi, uh, how many cases, uh, uh, you probably have a database on those, uh, have you done at the Cleveland Clinic since you joined? Not, not that many, actually. As we were talking about it today, they come in, uh, they come in you know, waves. Uh, yeah. but um, I would say less than 10. Less than 10. And um, you ha what, what kind of, um, you, you talked about uh, the procedures in theory. So there is physical uh, clot extraction, either with a stent retriever or with a suction device. Uh, and then there is uh, thrombolytic therapy. Um, and you showed this one example where the bleed uh, extended uh, with, uh, with thrombolytics, which I think, 
um, is coincidental because, I mean, it's a venous infarct and not an arterial infarct. So I think this is unfortunate. Uh, this may have happened anyway. Um, but uh, how would you, this is one, one question also from the audience, um, how would you or, uh, explore a little bit on, on what you would use in what cases? When would you do pharmacological versus, um, versus physical retraction? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I guess it depends on the degree of recanalization. So if, if clots are not that organized, if the patient has a fairly recent history of headaches, you would presume that these are fairly fresh clots and therefore it is easier to advance our devices. So um, if you're able to get through to the sinuses reasonably, uh, then you can just deal with uh, uh, aspiration thrombectomy or a stent retriever thrombectomy. But if your recanalization rates are not good using these methods, I would certainly consider either giving a little bolus of uh, TPA or leaving a catheter in there. So uh, I would base it on the degree of recanalization. If you've already achieved an excellent recanalization, uh, then I don't think there's additional need to give thrombolytic. The second one is uh, we just can't get our devices up there. So we can't get our large bore aspiration catheters, but we may be able to snake a micro catheter through so in this case, we, we only have an option to give thrombolytics. Uh, Artiza, do you have something to add there? No, no, I, I would echo uh, Sebi's sentiment. So as he was saying, we just did a case over the last two days of a chronic venous occlusion, acute on chronic. And uh, the first day we could not get a catheter in. So we, we put a micro catheter in and we infused TPA overnight. So the patient remained intubated, sedated, paralyzed, and we infused TPA at one milligram an hour into the sagittal sinus. And the next day when we went back, um, there was enough of a channel that we could now get our catheters in there and carry out thrombectomy. So I think there's no, we have to kind of tailor it to the situation. It, um, I think acute thrombus, as Sebi showed, opens very nicely with mechanical disruption. But once it becomes organized and chronic, um, then I think there is a more role for thrombolysis. And I, I'd like to echo uh, Dirk's uh, sentiments that I think it was unfortunate, um, but TPA in this instance uh, uh, is a, 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 it's a concomitant factor. I don't think it's the etiology. This patient was actively deteriorating and bleeding. The hematoma developed within 60 minutes, the first and second scan. So uh, the fact that the hematoma continued to expand, I'm not surprised in that scenario. Uh, but I was hoping that if we could ask uh, both you as part of our panel, what, what's your process? And I think the main, the main issue that I sometimes get um, not annoyed, but kind of disgruntled with is when patients have not been, received an adequate trial of anticoagulation as defined by reaching a therapeutic level, getting the right dose. Um, a lot of colleagues will shy away. And I think if anything, if we can use this platform today to educate all our colleagues that, you know, uh, as Sebi pointed out from the ICVST trial, the presence of hemorrhage on a scan in the context of CVT um, is not a contraindication for anticoagulation. You have to treat these patients aggressively up front. And I was just wondering what your practices are. So, Hale, Dirk, uh, would you like to weigh in on this? Uh, yeah. So go ahead, Dirk. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, what, what I can say is um, I, I, I absolutely agree with what uh, Teza just said. I mean, this is in particular for the 1,200 people that are listening. It's really, really important. These venous infarcts, uh, they are not arterial infarcts, and you don't have to shy away from using uh, anticoagulation. You should use it in the dose um, that is uh, appropriate for the case. Um, what I would like to say, and I would also like to elicit uh, a response from, from both of our speakers, uh, and that is when I was in, in, um, in Copenhagen, we were the national referral center for uh, sinus venous thrombosis. And if you are um, the, the national referral center um, of 5 million people living in Denmark, and all of these sinus venous thrombosis uh, come to one center, then you actually end up with a few cases. And so we actually had more venous infarcts than arterial infarcts. This was in 2008, um, when, when, uh, when there was no yet uh, thrombectomy uh, uh, for arterial um, um, uh, lesions uh, 
um, appointed in Copenhagen, but we had probably one or two a month. And what we did is, again, the, the technology was not there yet. And so we ended up in most of the cases using uh, intravenous uh, catheters, multi-lumen intravenous catheters, the same ones that have been used in the DVTs uh, in the old days. Um, and we left them in the patients for 24 hours, repeated the angiogram and so forth. And, and I must say what, what struck me was the, and, and, um, and Sebi pointed to this, the, the variation of the venous anatomy. But there's one other thing. Um, if you do sequential venous angiograms, they never look like the same because it depends on the pressure. It depends on how, how much you inject, how you inject. And uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to quantify this. And I remember one case it was a young woman um, who was in her 20s and had this horrible deep uh, thrombosis, which, which we, for us was a, was a, um, um, a, red, uh, a red flag of using um, uh, intra, intravenous uh, thrombolysis. And, and so um, we had this patient uh, for days and in the, it looked the same and it, it, was, uh, it was still looking very, very bad in terms of the uh, venogram. And then we said after a week or so, we have to wake her up and have to see what's, what's gonna happen. And believe it or not, two days later, she was awake. So by just, and, and Irtiza uh, uh, alluded to this, by just changing the venous anatomy just a little bit, you can actually drain this whole thing and, uh, and, and, and you, you, you treat the, the case. So um, I would like to hear what, what, uh, what Sebi and Irtiza uh, say to this um, notion. Absolutely. We were just talking about this today uh, and, you know, and um, we were looking at Sebi's cases for this presentation and, uh, you know, we don't, we, we don't shoot for perfect pictures. As long as the brain is draining and we usually have a catheter on the arterial side and we're looking at transit times, if the hemisphere is looking relaxed and we have anti-grade flow and there's significant recanalization, the goal of endovascular thrombectomy and CVT is just to reestablish outflow. It can be minimal outflow, um, 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 but that's the goal. And as long as the transit time looks better, you don't have to go shoot for perfect pictures. Um, and, and that's usually what we shoot for. And then obviously we continue medical management um, um, with anticoagulation. Yeah. Sebi? Yes, and just to add, uh, uh, you're just creating uh, also, I feel, uh, channels for the heparin to work on. If, if there's no surface for the heparin to work on, uh, then it's not going to promote any more recanalization or uh, prevent extension of thrombosis. So the little channels that you create will eventually extend into the cortical veins. And uh, like you said, there's so much redundancy and so much variation, maybe just one little thing which opens up and that will be enough for the patient. If I, no, if that's I, add, if I will add something here, uh, Derek, regarding uh, our experience at Rashid Hospital, we just published uh, a paper uh, descriptive about our uh, series of uh, CBT, which is almost uh, more than 150 plus uh, patients from Rashid Hospital uh, by Dr. Jawid Pornami and Maria. Uh, plus, uh, Maria published her paper about using NUAC in uh, CBT patients from Rashid. One of the things that, um, it's very rare condition. I remember being at uh, Montreal for seven years, uh, per year, you will, we will get one to two patients maximum. And there will be a grand round about that patients to speak about venous thrombosis that we don't see, which is a rare condition. Condition. Uh, at Rashid Hospital, we are, we are getting per year between uh, uh, 25 to 30 patients CVT. Uh, in uh, early 2012, 2013, uh, we were giving at that time uh, uh, IV uh, uh, heparin, uh, which was uh, patients need to admit to the ICU because of doing uh, and uh, coagulation profile every couple of uh, hours to uh, take the, the right uh, decision about the level of herpanization. I remember for the last five years, everyone will be admitted to high dependency stroke unit, not to the ICU, sub-Q heparin, 60 BD or uh, 80, whatever, depend on the weight, and rarely will have a complication with that. With those patients who's coming with intracranial bleed, as uh, Sebi showed, it's very safe. 
uh, really patients will have uh, any complication with the full anticoagulation of these patients. But we try to avoid admitting these patients to the ICU because there where we having the anticoagulation protocol for uh, uh, intravenous uh, heparin. Second thing, uh, just as you are mentioning the cases, we admit a recent patients with bilateral thrombosis of jugular vein, uh, internal jugular, bilateral sigmoid, bilateral transverse, superior sagittal. There's nothing. And the patient was full puffy swollen face because it seems everything is drained extracranial. How? We are not sure, but when we did the CT angio, his face was like an apple, tomato, okay? Full anticoagulation, patients went home walking, not intubated, nothing is there. We did with Dr. Ayman al in 2013, maybe four cases. Maybe the devices at that time was not the best, but we didn't have a good outcome with these patients. Uh, one patient had a rupture, Three of them didn't have a good uh, 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 recanalization. Suction wasn't there available at that time, I believe, uh, for the interventionist. Uh, we found uh, very rarely that we were required to do any intervention for these patients. Before I forget, uh, Mr. Uh, Ahmed, one of my patients, local 21, Ertiza, he was full thrombose, there's no single vein was draining there. Intubated, uh, ventricles was compressed bilateral, nothing is there. I spoke with the new surgery for decompression. They said, Suhail, no hope. I spoke with the mother. The only time that when I spoke with the uh, first time to do this mistake, that unfortunate mother of Ahmed, your son is very critical. I don't think he's going to survive, but we didn't stop the anticoagulation. We continue on anticoagulation, full hydration. After 21 days, extubated, the boy is coming once a month to say hello to Dr. Sahel. There's mild mental uh, uh, insult was there, walking in the dependent, driving his car on anti-epileptic, wonderful. So the CVT pathology is totally that different than others. If you treat these patients with good anticoagulation, good hydration, keep them on the, those doses. If you require to be intubated, intubated, maybe we need mechanical thrombectomy, intravenous TPA between two brackets. But I remember for the last five years, six, six years, we didn't do any intervention. We didn't require that in Rashid Hospital, but very interesting cases. There's one Wait. question, Dr. Saeed Artiza, Derek, Thanks. as we are getting close to the end. Uh, for the intracerebral lymphoma, Dr. Artiza, what's the possible of diagnosis by CSF analysis from Dr. Abdul Karim? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. So if we go to the olden days uh, where, um, you know, malignancies were diagnosed by CSF only, and you look at that literature, uh, the sensitivity of a single CSF sample is very, very low. I think it was below 30%. Um, when we add, that's just looking at cytology. If you add flow cytometry and then spin for it, um, you potentially may increase the sensitivity. But in, the, in intravascular lymphoma, by definition, usually um, you don't have significant cell presence within the CSF space. On a, this patient was tapped uh, uh, in the native country. Uh, there were no, uh, there was no pleocytosis. When we tapped her, she again only had two cells. So the yield for a intravascular lymphoma may be low. Now, where we have to separate this from people who have CNS lymphomatosis, right, or basilar meningitis, or you know what we would say leptomeningeal lymphomatosis that's a completely different animal and there the yield may be more so. Um, nevertheless, we did do a CSF analysis as part of our vasculitic atypical inflammatory workup and um, everything came back negative normal. So again, uh, you can do a CSF sample, but I think the, the money is on the biopsy. You have to go to the biopsy. Mm. Do Dr. I, um, Dr. Sebi, there's one question regarding uh, decompressed trial and uh, decompression and uh, CVT. Anything to add there? 
Um, yes, certainly. If you have uh, uh, large lesions, herniations, or um, um, or bleeds, uh, uh, you have to decompress and then continue anticoagulation. I don't think there's a trial. I'm not aware of a trial on it, but I would say that if mass effect is a significant problem, uh, then you have to decompress and then continue anticoagulation. Good. I, I wanted to say something about this too, because I, we've, we still have 1,200 people uh, with us. Um, and, and this is very important, uh, uh, you know, from an educational perspective. Um, you know, we, we tank these people with, uh, with heparin. And then all of a sudden we ask the surgeon, please do a hemicranectomy. <laughs> this is... Uh, this is, uh, sounds um, counterintuitive, um, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of neurosurgeons will say, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. Uh, but as a matter of fact, I mean, there's, as, as Sebi just pointed out, there is no um, controlled trial or not even large series. But the people that I oversee um, in, in Copenhagen, and, uh, and we have done it uh, also in, uh, in, in Heidelberg, uh, because after all, I'm from the Hacke School, and the decompressive surgery was always very, very close to us. And uh, I've seen wonderful results. And I think it has to do also um, that you give, uh, you, you, you change the compliance and you increase the venous flow, even if there's everything is thrombosed. Uh, the collaterals uh, of, uh, through the labe and through uh, through other areas, and so maybe even extracranial. So, so I think um, um, this is something that I, I would like to, uh, the two panelists uh, from Cleveland also um, to to tell us uh, that uh, that the hemicranectomy or even a bilateral uh, uh, hemicranectomies in these patients, where only the uh, the, the sinus is is covered with with uh, calotte. Um, is actually an option in, in cases, and we have to decide uh, when we're going to use this. Please. Want to go, Ortiza? Uh, go ahead, my friend. Yeah, like you said, uh, we need buy-in from our neurosurgeons. So um, uh, I, I would say, especially for young patients, uh, if it is uh, unilateral, uh, we often push them uh, for sure uh, to do a hemicranectomy. Uh, for the bilateral hemicranectomy, um, it's been many years since uh, I've had a patient who we've done a bilateral hemicranectomy. But uh, I would say for a one sided hemicranectomy, I have no reservations uh, in asking my neurosurgeon to do it. Yeah, and I, I agree. And that's been our practice here. So some of these saves that uh, you've seen here today. A lot of those saves have involved early surgical decompression. Um, so the heparin is on, literally is turned off as the patient's going to the OR. Uh, they may give some protamine just for the purpose of the surgery. Once the surgery is done and they have good hemostasis of the wound, uh, heparin, heparin is restarted. And I, I, I agree, Dirk. Uh, I think sometimes when you're on that, the compliance is, you know, where everything is so tight that now the elevated ICP from the vasogenic edema in itself is uh, perfusion is failing. And sometimes just opening up that box in addition to anticoagulation is what's required. So we've seen many patients uh, over the last uh, couple of years who really benefited from hemicraniectomy within CBT. And, uh, and with CBT, you know, when you're in the midst of the storm, it feels like all is lost. We've all had miracle stories where patients have walked back, just like Suhail has said and Dirk. Um, and, and, you know, and it's, it's so rewarding when you see that because, you know, they were in such dire straits and everybody would have just written them off. But I, I, I would argue venous thrombosis is a different beast. And if, if you can buy them time, somehow, somehow blood flow is redirected. And, uh, and I think that's a key point in this. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for these uh, assessments. I think this was very um, interesting and, uh, and educational um, to, to talk about venous thrombosis rather than uh, arterial thrombectomies. <laughs> Suhail, do you have any final words? Okay, thank you. It was a wonderful 90 minutes uh, for both speaker and for the co-chair. I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Saeed Artiza, Chairman of Neurology at Cleveland Abu Dhabi, and our uh, new friend, Dr. Sebi Jones from uh, 
Cleveland Abu Dhabi neurointervention neurologist and our uh, co-chair, uh, Dr. Uh, our Professor Derek Kreger from Dubai. The CME hours will be sent to all of the attendees within two weeks after the uh, presentation. This presentation is CME, two hour CME accredited there. It's endorsed by WSO, American Stroke Association and organized by the MENA Stroke Organization. Uh, we will see you next month. Month. We will have a, a, a group of speakers from the U.S. with us and from Saudi Arabia. So wait to see all of you in a few weeks. Thank you both, speaker. Thank you, Dr. Derek.